Thank you all for joining us today. As many of you know, Legacy Business League was, is a minority chamber that's here on the Mississippi Gulf Coast. And our goal is to network, develop, and empower minority professionals to pursue their dreams uh, and their careers as um, entrepreneurs or uh, business professionals. And so we provide a space um, for them to be able to learn and grow and develop. We have a program called TAP, which is, stands for the Access Project. And the Access Project began uh, because we were noticing a lot of minorities um, did not have access to information, to resources that would help them grow their businesses. And so um, our organization uh, founded this program and um, our first project is the Business Starter. So we have about 16 um, folks that are with us that go, uh, that have been involved since I think March. Um, in the Business Starter Program. Our first, uh, we kicked off with marketing with Angie Juzang and we had an interview with Carrie Paul. And then in uh, May, we have been going through a series on operations. And today I have with me Myron McCoo, um, who will talk, we're talking everything about HR. You know, everything that you wanted to know about human resources is what we'll be talking about today. And so Myron, thank you so much for being willing to join us. Uh, I know you're a super busy uh, man, but if you wouldn't mind, introduce yourself to everybody. Uh, so Dr. Scott, thank you very much uh, for first having me. I am so excited to be talking about this um, uh, area of HR. This is my calling. Uh, a little bit about myself. I'm currently the Vice President for Human Resources at Memorial Hospital in Gulfport. Um, my background, I'm from Texas. I grew up in a small rural town in East Texas. Educationally, I received my bachelor's degree from the University of Texas at Austin, my master's from Harvard, and my law degree from Indiana University School of Law in Bloomington. Um, I worked briefly as an attorney in Chicago and Milwaukee uh, in law school and out law school, but I transitioned over to human resources well, actually, I began my human resources career before going to law school. I interned for Senator Edward M. Kennedy in his Committee of Labor and Human Resources during my gap year between Texas and Harvard. And that's what really sparked my interest in, in human resources. And I sort of followed that path. Um, I've held leadership positions in HR, uh, vice president, VP positions at Brigham Women's Hospital in Boston, uh, Dartmouth College in Hanover, New Hampshire, Yale, New Haven, health system, as well as um, my current employer, Memorial Hospital. So I am so grateful to be here and hopefully um, I can share a couple of words with you folks today. Absolutely. Well, I tell you, just listening to all of those things, we, we're, the coast is blessed to have you, Memorial is blessed to have you, but most importantly, Legacy is blessed to have you this evening to be able to share with us. One of the things that we wanted to do, Myron, is make sure that we get not just resources to our, to our folks, but we get top-notch resources to our folks. Um, you know, as you well know, many of them are, you know, either expanding their entrepreneurial efforts, uh, their businesses, or just starting, you know, so they have trusted us with their dreams, and we want to um, guide them in bringing those to fruition. So we'll jump right in. One of the things that I've been talking with the team about um, this, dur during this time is, um, the team that you start with may not be the team that you finish with. And sometimes people get disheartened by that when people leave, you know, you, they started out in the inception of the business and, you know, thinking through it and then people walk away um, or, you know, may leave for whatever the reasons are. What are your thoughts on that? You know, that, that's a great question. You know, natural matriculation over time is perfectly fine. Obviously, there's an emotional commitment you have to people you work with the people that may work for you, but people grow, businesses grow. As businesses grow, people grow. And sometimes the growth is necessary to make sure that the uh, mission is accomplished. So for those people that um, may be disheartened that people may leave through either natural matriculation, through growth, sometimes it's not the good, that's okay. That's okay. And if you think about it, the cost of a bad hire, the cost of a bad employee far exceeds the productivity of a good hire. So, you know, it, it's okay. It's okay if people leave. That's right. That's right. Um, along those, those, those lines, um, some of the things that came out of our conversations was at-will employment. 
So a lot of people think, you know, if you're in a state that's at will, that, you know, you don't have anything to worry about. And, you know, what I always say is at will does not mean that you are at, (laughs) that you can, you know, behave any way that you want to. And it doesn't mean that you um, are exempt from uh, being a good leader or from documentation. What, what are some of your thoughts on at will? Can you talk with us about what that really means and and give some advice? You know, so at will really is just a legal term. Um, and you're absolutely right. You know, um, at will means that an employee can resign at any point. There's no contract between the employee and employer. And that the employer can terminate the employee at any point. What at will does not mean is that you can terminate based on a illegal reason, such as gender, race. You know, you, you folks know the, the drill. Um, so that's all that at will means is that, is that you're not obliged to stay up the organization. Um, any period of time, an organization is not obliged to keep you. Now, that being said, the industry norm for most organizations, if you're an hourly employee, if you do leave an organization, you typically give two weeks notice. If you're salaried, one month's notice. That's sort of the industry norm, but that's all that at will means. Oftentimes, you're absolutely right. People get the um, uh, definition and understanding of at will confused, meaning that um, I, can, I can fire you if you are African-American. No. Nope, nope, that's illegal. So um, that's really all, all at will means. And, you know, the thing that people need to realize is that from a recruiting perspective, and if you look at what's happening in our economy right now, pre-COVID, unemployment was at about 4%. And that's scary. When you have unemployment that low, although it's good for the economy and it's good for people, it's scary for businesses and organizations because uh, when you look at the generational issues of baby, boom, baby boomers are retiring out, um, it's just going to be very difficult to recruit certain positions. Um, and now that we're coming out of COVID and the pandemic, we're seeing that, right? We're seeing, obviously, a new administration. Uh, we're seeing um, executive orders put out there that are increasing the minimum wage for federal contractors to $15 an hour and trying to boost the economy. But the fact of the matter is, is that there just aren't enough people for all the positions out there. Um, And, you know, it's important for any organization, any size, to make sure that they hire the right people, Uh, people that are aligned to the mission of the organization, that that buys into the mission, vision, and values, um, that um, are hard workers, because what happens inevitably, I I was just um, in a a conference, a virtual conference, where we're talking about the cost of turnover. And in my industry, the cost of turnover is about $622 per day per vacancy. Now, we're a large organization. We have about 5,000 employees. That gets pretty pricey. But it doesn't necessarily exempt uh, smaller organizations or mid-sized organizations from similar costs. So it's important that um, owners, managers, uh, principals make the right hires and that they don't get um, intertwined in making bad decisions that would result in legal action because legal actions are costly liabilities are costly but also the court of public opinion if you're going out there and you have a reputation of doing something that is either unethical or illegal you know that can really ruin an organization's brand and i know that um, my colleague Angie Zhang was on here earlier and i'm sure she talked about brand and the importance of brand from an hr perspective and from legal perspective it's just as important making sure that you have a viable brand and that your organization from a hiring perspective and from a reputational perspective can really ensure that you're doing the right thing. And that's one thing that a lot of folks are really into, well, it's the right thing to do, but social justice issues are key. And I think that that's something that, you know, any organizational leader needs to also be in tune with. So to answer your question, at will employment really is a legal definition, but there are so many cascading um, issues of making sure that you hire the right person, that you don't do things that are outside the bounds of ethics or legal or law um, in terms of how you handle your employees, because it can come back, it can come back to bite you. You know, what, what do they say about karma? Same thing for hiring and, and maintaining a good employee, um, employee employment relationship with those folks that work in your organization. Yeah, I'm, I'm very glad that you touched on that because, you know, it all starts with the right hire for the right reasons for the right position and not being rushed in that. You know, I can think of times, you know, certainly 
you know, have gotten in a rush or, you know, we got a vacancy and I wanted to rush to fill it and, you know, did not go through the full process. And there is not one time that I did not regret that or hiring because I got a feeling, you know, rather than really matching them up with do your skills match what we need here for this position? What are, what are your thoughts on that? You know, you're absolutely right. And, and from HR perspective and from a legal perspective, um, there's something called negligent hiring, right? Negligent hiring is not doing the right due diligence, not doing the reference checks, not doing the background checks, not making sure that they have the right skill sets for the job. Okay. Um, and obviously, you, you want to make sure you hire the right person because no matter the size of your organization, if you have a, a bad hire or someone who's not aligned to the mission of the organization or the direction of the organization, then that can that can make things go sideways very quickly. Right. So it's all about making sure you do the preparatory work and getting the right person in. Because if you have that person, right? If you have that person that's aligned to your vision, that's aligned to the vision of if you have partners or principals or even coworkers, you know, you, you talk about a dream team. That dream team can make your business go from good to great like that. That's right. That's right. One of the things that's important, so we've made the right hire. And then uh, oftentimes, you know, we don't have time to get them situated in the organization. It's just, you're hired, now go make magic happen. <laughs> um, so talk about how important onboarding is to the process. I mean, I know, you know, I, you know, I lead a nonprofit and it is it, sometimes that there have been times where that's, you know, moved to the shadows. Every single time it's, it's been the biggest mistake ever made. Uh, no matter how much of a rush you are to get a uh, someone in a seat, it is most important that we get them, um, that we bring them in the right way and that we get them in the right seat. So onboarding is something that, you know, we get in a rush. And I can imagine we have a lot of um, our participants um, are, you know, wanting to own business, food businesses. Mm -hmm. And sometimes though, it happens a lot in restaurants where it's like, look, we just need you in here to get on this line and cook, but we really need to take a step back. Well, you know, I'll give you this example, right? If you have a restaurant and you want to hire uh, a chef and you don't onboard that chef to food safety precautions right. and that chef undercooks chicken and the entire restaurant gets sick, then that lack of preparation, that lack of onboarding, getting that, that chef prepared for where the thermometers are, you know, make sure that the stoves are at the right temperature, can be a, a financial cost, a financial and health cost. So, you know, onboarding is critically important um, in any organizations. And obviously, you know, particularly if you're a smaller organization, um, you want to you want to have a person up and running very quickly, right? right? But if you get a person and you don't get them uh, acclimated to the environment, if you don't get them um, acclimated to the work culture. If you don't help them understand the policies and procedures, if you don't sit down with them and explain what your vision is, then not only are they going to have a bad experience, they'll be lost. They will be lost. And, you know, you will have a high turnover rate. Uh, that person may not stay very long. And then you have to start the process over again, which is costly. Um, so there's so many factors and so many elements um, of onboarding that are critically important at every organization. Um, in healthcare, you know, we have to onboard nurses. Oftentimes, nurses from that have just graduated that just passed their NCLEX, and we understand that it's it's considered non-productive time. But you know, our business is patient care, and we want to make sure that our patients receive the best care, and we make sure that those nurses have mentors that they have preceptors, that they get training on our systems. Because if, if someone messes something up, if a new hire messes up in healthcare, the, the consequences could be deadly. So, um, so you know, and, and, and you, when you look at that from any organizational size, um, the same most true in terms of finances, um, the raw, you know, if you don't give the person the, your vision or the culture of the organization, uh, that person can uh, have misunderstanding, mis misinterpretation, create a toxic work environment. There are so many ways they can go sideways that having a strong onboarding session, and it doesn't have to be fancy. Right. It could be, if it's a three-person three shop, it could just be sitting down for a couple hours with the person, 
um, walking through how you create the organization, what the purpose of the business is, um, so, some aspects of the business plan, certain safety precautions, just making sure that the person coming into your organization um, understands every, everything they can. Now, that being said, you know, there's going to be on the job training no matter what organization you go to. Right. Um, that's to be expected. And that's, you know, that's, how, that's how people grow. But the onboarding process, the orientation process, and like I said, if you're a large organization, you typically have like a week orientation, buddy mentor type of program. If you're a small organization, it might just be sitting down in your office and walking through certain key aspects of how you create the organization, the purpose, uh, the stakeholders, and how important that person is within the organization. Right, that's important. Um, I, I love that you brought up culture. <clears throat> One of the, I read something not too long ago, it's been many years ago actually, where it talked about um, strategy, you know, and, and it talked about how culture will eat strategy. Um, if we don't get culture right, that, um, you know, nothing that we do, um, culture is powerful because it is, it is how we do what we do here. It is what we believe, um, you know, it speaks to our, you know, our values. And so talk to me a little bit about um, how you have helped to create and or maintain the right culture, you know, and right is, you know, you know, we, we, everybody has something that's right for them, but, but let's just say healthy. Um, how, what, what are some of the tactics that you've used? You know, I gotta say, um, what I tell my managers and the people that I work with is, you know, culture is a lot, a lot of things, a lot of different people. And in order to understand the culture in which you're in, particularly if you're in a leadership position, you must listen with the ear of the heart. Mm -hmm. You must be able to appreciate differences. You must embrace diversity. You must enhance, um, you must um, have inclusion and truly make sure that the culture is one in which um, all aspects of culture, all aspects of the people are accepted. I think that, um, you know, oftentimes people will make, um, confuse culture with diversity. You know, they go hand in hand, they're two separate things, but a, a strong and healthy culture in the workplace uh, with employees will promote um, strong earnings. It will promote um, a strong yield. And for us, and I've been in healthcare for a long time, it's important for our culture to embrace diversity and inclusion because our workforce needs to reflect the patient population that we serve. Uh, we need to be able to understand cultural competencies regarding um, birth issues, regarding end of life issues, because that's, 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 that's what we do. So, you know, it's, it's important for a positive culture to be set at the highest level of the organization. And then obviously, uh, based on whoever's leading the organization, the principal, president, manager, um, owner, um, you know, the, they, they should have aspects of diversity, inclusion, and equity within that. Because if you, if you don't, if you are an organization where employees are afraid to talk with you, where employees are afraid to ask questions, where employees are afraid to, you know, do the right thing, it, the consequences for, you know, the back end, the business end could really be detrimental. It really can be. And that goes across all, all industries. That's right. That's right. Thank you for that. So, you know, I was raised in the South um, from Alabama. We are all on the Mississippi Gulf Coast now in the South. And so, you know, there's a term for business around here. Smaller businesses are sometimes called mom and pop or small businesses. Yeah. Um, when one is finding themselves, you know, we, have, we have some folks that are in our program that are moving from mom and pop or small business to this corporate, corporate uh, structure where they're wanting to scale their business. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of times when people grow, you know, you, you know, we go to places and it's grown, it's got bigger. It's like, they're just not the same anymore. You know, something's missing. Tell me how would you say that one keeps that heart uh, at the same time, making their business scalable, right? We're moving from a hot dog stand to, 
franchising, you know, where we're, we're going to have these things all over the country. How do you keep that small feel, but know that it's time to grow? Yeah. You know, um, that, that's a great question. That is a great question. Um, personally, I think it's, it's important for whoever is, it's, just, it's like, it's like their baby, right? Uh, right. This is the baby they gave birth to. Right. It could be a, it could be a hot dog stand, as you said, it could be a, a brand product, yeah. but the person who who came up with the ideal and or their partners, um, they know they they know the secret sauce of how to make sure that the end product is always going to be a good product, right? Um, and and so, sometimes sometimes some organizations will intentionally want to stay smaller. They don't want to scale up. But for yeah. those organizations, those leaders that want to scale their organization, you know there there are things they just absolutely have to make sure that they keep in mind. Obviously, they'll keep the heart of the product, the heart of whatever they're, they're selling uh, true to itself. But from a compliance perspective, you know, you'll want to make sure that you uh, work with the right sorts of professionals, uh, be it tax professionals, be it lawyers, attorneys, be it sometimes HR folks to make sure you don't fall into those pitfalls where you can't even do business anymore. The, the goal is to make sure that your business remains intact. But also, if you do so choose to scale up and have larger, a larger footprint, that you're doing things from a legal perspective, from a regulatory perspective, that you, you know, pay your taxes right, that you make sure you prepare correctly, make sure your articles, if you're doing articles of incorporation or LLC, make sure you have the right um, people helping you to ensure that you're protecting the best interest of your organization, yourself and your partners, uh, because if you don't do that, if, if you don't do that correctly, um, if you don't have a trademark, people, there's so many negative things that can happen. Mm -hmm. So it's all about making sure um, you think about that, um, your, your protection, liability, uh, making sure that you can continue to do your business. Uh, if you're particularly if you, as you get bigger, larger and larger, and oftentimes um, large organizations will have HR departments, tax departments. And I, I realize that's the um, plausible for small organizations, but what I would encourage um, those folks that do want to increase their footprint to work with professionals like you, you know, to contact an, perhaps an attorney, uh, just to walk through some of those things they want to do. Because I got to tell you, sometimes if you don't, if you don't, if you don't have the right insurances, if you don't have the right um, articles of incorporation, if you don't have a trademark, then all the good work that you do can be taken away like that. Um, but, you know, the fact of the matter is, I think that people who truly um, have an organization or a product that is their baby, that will always be their baby. Right. They, they know, they know what the secret sauce is to make the product. They just need help in maybe perhaps scaling it up, making sure that they have certain protections, making sure they do the right thing from a tax perspective, just making sure that they can protect their baby. Right. So, so, so ultimately we saying keep the sauce the same, like don't, don't change anything about that because we're about to mass produce, but in order to take that um, on a bigger scale, we, we're going to have to, we're going to have to push up on that, um, you know, on the, on the business side of things and make sure that those things are taken care of. Uh, one of the things that you said um, earlier made me think of this. Um, uh, you know, I, I, there are times where, you know, I hate saying work family mm -hmm. um, because there are times, um, uh, unfortunately, uh, where it gives people permission to act less professional. Mm -hmm. And and this idea that, um, you know, in my family, you know, you know, if, if, you know, I'm dealing with a brother, sister or cousin, you know, they're yelling out or they're misbehaving, you know, they're still family. They still get to be in the family, you know, but at work doesn't translate very well. And so talk to me a little bit about, you know, how do we um, maintain those professional boundaries when, mm -hmm. yes, we are spending a whole bunch of time together and we are, you know, getting to know each other and we do care about each other. And as the years go by, we may even love each other, but we're still at work, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so talk with me about that dance because sometimes that's a dance, Myron. It, it just, you know, it it's not straightforward at times. It is. It is. And, you know, I, I go back to my childhood. Um, my mother and father would say there were house rules. In this house, 
you gotta be in you gotta be inside by the time the uh, lights outside come on. Yeah, street lights. In this house, you you have to call us if you're gonna be ten minutes late. In this house, you have to go to school and go to Sunday school. So I, I akin to that, and, and my father would always say, if you don't want to be in this house, then we'll pack your bags so you can find another house. And those were the house rules. And really, the same I think the same is true in any organization. You have to have house rules. Um, house rules uh, govern the organization. They Govern our house. They govern my my house, um, and if people in the family, my, my own family or my work family, don't want to adhere to the house rules, the policies, then they can go to another house. Yeah. So it comes that, down. That's how far. That's how far. No, no, that's real because, and that's exactly where I wanted you to land. Is that these policies and procedures guide us um, for the days that you know we don't agree. And we need a guide. We need to know when we're all agreeing and everybody's having a good time. There's there's no issue. We we don't even look for the employee manual. We only go find the employee manual and dust it off when when there's conflict. And a good thing that we have it. Uh, but it's but it's important because you know it is. Um, you know there still is a business to run, and there is still is a way that we will go about running that business. And so you, I think you're 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 exactly right. Um, and, and it it protects, you know, it also protects safety. I mean, there's safety issues there. You know, you, you, the, the family, if people horseplay, and, you know, they can hurt themselves. So if they're following the rules of the house, um, there are precautions to make sure people remain safe while working. Same when you're, same in your, your personal house. You, you, you right. don't let your loved ones do crazy things with knives or guns. You know, they, there, there are house rules that people adhere to that deal with safety. And, and that's exactly, that's exactly right, Dr. Scott. That is right. Absolutely. That's a good policy. So um, what are some tools or resources that you could give um, those that are new in managing people, um, you know, so, some, some tools or resources that you could give them on how to effectively manage yep. a yep. team or staff? Yep. So um, that, that's a really good question. Um, I, I really think that new managers, new leaders, folks who are managing people for the first time, particularly if they own the business, right? If that's their own business, that they're going to make mistakes and it's okay. Um, you know, I think it's important that new leaders um, talk with folks who have done this before, uh, just to find out what the pitfalls might be. Um, that they, you know, that they not be ashamed to ask questions of people. You know, I, I think mentorship is a key, it's, it's important, no, no matter, no matter what you do, and from an industry perspective, it's important for any leader, actually any employee too, but any leader to have a mentor uh, that they can go to and bounce things off of. Because particularly as you're getting into managing folks, um, you may not know the rules of the road. You may not know the laws. You may not know certain loopholes that you can take advantage of. You may not know of things that will help you from a financial perspective. And it's important that you can go to someone who's already experienced it um, and navigate it through that um, to be able to, to bounce those questions off. Now, that being said, uh, there are probably going to be situations where new leaders just can't um, ask every question and they, they will learn from those mistakes. The other thing is learning from your mistakes. That's, learning yeah. from your mistakes. Yeah. That's the key thing. You, you are going mistakes. to make them. <laughs> Hear me, class. Yeah. You are going to make them. Um, Lord knows I have from everything we've talked about, from the hiring to all of it, you know, you're going to make mistakes. I think uh, the difference uh, for any leader is that you learn from them and you grow from them and you do better the next time. Uh, but there is no such thing as, as perfection. Okay, so those are great tools and resources for managing employees. What are some for employee discipline? <laughs> um, employee discipline? That's a great question. That is a great question. You know, tools or resources that will be helpful. You know, always be fair. Always be fair. Um, don't get taken advantage of. Um, no lie. No lie when you hear it. <laughs> um, and you know, as long as as long as you're fair, and as long as you go through what we talked about, try your best to make the right hire. Do the background checks. Screen appropriately. Don't be impetuous to hire. As long as you onboard appropriately. As long as you can acculturate that person to your culture, as long as you can help them understand the why to your business, and as long as you're fair, and as long as you set guidelines and create a policy. And it doesn't have to be a 500-page policy. 
it just has to be the rules sort of roll for that business, then I think that um, that will mitigate um, significant discipline. And if you have to discipline someone, be fair. You know, if it's a situation where the person just not coming to work, then, you know, they're big, they're big boys and girls that can, if they don't want to work for you, they can work for somebody else. So if it's where they made a mistake, where they just didn't, they may have made a mistake because they didn't know the process, be fair about it, help them, educate them. Um, and if they continue to make that mistake, then, you know, document it. And if it's a performance issue, you may have to put together a performance improvement plan. Um, it doesn't have to be a fancy performance improvement plan, but just make sure that you document that you've had the conversation, that you give them the right resources for remediation. And if the employee still can't, um, if they still can't achieve what your desired results are, then you, they, you may have to have that hard conversation with employees. But you know, it is, it is a, it's a process and it's a cycle. Um, obviously, larger organizations may offer more latitude than smaller organizations just because of resources. But, um, but if you go through those different steps that we talked about, um, then I think they should be okay. They should be good. Yeah, I believe in that. Um, you know, we call it grace around here. Uh, we're, we're certainly going to give some grace. You know, I've received it and I'm going to give it. But there always comes that moment where you just got to make a tough decision. And it's never fun. It's never, you know, I had a director tell me, my director of operations told me many years ago, um, he's like, if it ever gets fun, you know, where you're enjoying, you know, dismissing people, then something's wrong. You really got to check your heart. Um, you know, it's never fun, but, you know, sometimes it's necessary. So let's say someone has made a, 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 the wrong hire and you know you have. What should yeah. you do? So if they've made the wrong hire, uh, don't anguish on it. Um, don't take forever to make a decision. Make a decision. Uh, be fair. And, you know, the employee may not necessarily write them there, but the employee will appreciate it in the long term. They yeah. really will. They absolutely will. I mean, you know, I, I, I see so many times where employees that were hired out of high school or college, they just can't wake up to go to get to work. And, you know, they have to be, you know, exited out. But when they mature and they, when they understand, they, they, they come back to their hiring managers, they thank them for giving them the opportunity because that's a learning opportunity for them as well. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's a two-way streak. I think that the employee and the employer are learning as they go through this process together. Yeah, no, I totally agree. They're, they're tough decisions, but you got to make them.